I'm Jane Purden. I'm the CEO of Women in Football. Women in Football is one of those great organisations where the name tells you what we do. It's, we, we do what it says on the tin and we are here to celebrate, support and champion women in the game. Our vision is a football industry that is truly diverse, truly inclusive and where everybody, regardless of what they look like, can thrive and reach their full potential. Hello, I'm, I'm Monique Chowdhury. Uh, I'm, I'm here in oh, multiple capacities, I think. So I, I am a board colleague of Jane. Uh, I'm a board member of Women in Football. I am also a non-exec director for Brentford Football Club and I also sit on the business advisory board for Sporting Equals. And in my day job, if there isn't enough that goes on in my day already, uh, I have a, a business called Career Path um, Consultancy and we specialise in inclusive leadership and strategic leadership development, strategic leadership consultancy. Hi, I'm, I'm Chris Paros. I am the co-chair of the Proud Lily Whites, which is the official Tottenham Hotspur LGBTQ plus supporters association. I'm also a trustee of Kick It Out and um, I'm on the board of the Football Supporters Association. Um, I like to say I'm a member of Women in Football, really sort of believe in, in the work that you do. And um, I like to think that sort of football can be a positive force for social and cultural transformation. And I'm, you know, going to be part of a movement that makes the game more diverse, equal and inclusive. I'm Lorna Falconer. I am uh, Head of Football Operations at Brentford Football Club. Here with my colleague Monique. I've um, had a 25 year football career, so worked in the game for some time alongside Jane at one time, at, 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 for a short period. So yeah, that's me. Hello, I'm uh, Sanjay Bandari. I'm the Chair of Kick It Out, which is football's equality and inclusion organisation and our ambition is to make football a place where everyone feels that they belong. Um, I've got a few other things that I do in my life, but they're nothing to do with football, so I won't bore you with them. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Lengi. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Birmingham City Football Club. I also sit on the board alongside Monique um, and obviously colleagues with Jane at Women in Football. I joined Women in Football back in 2018 and um, I've got a background in HR and I've worked in, in professional football for, for about eight years now. Let's start with a, a, a headline question. I'm going to address this to the two women who are working in clubs right now, so, so Lorna and Lungi. How, how do you feel about being a woman in your current role? Does it feel more difficult or more unusual in your area of football? Lorna, do you want to go first? Thank you. Um, I don't know if I would say more difficult. It's a, it's a challenge. It's um, it's interesting, and I do. I think the good thing with my role at the moment and where I work and and my colleagues at Brentford, it, it's good that I've got quite a bit of um, football knowledge and a football background, and I've got really good colleagues. But, so it, it, for me, it's it's easier. I don't know how I would feel if I was stepping into it today. I think it, it might be a little different, but um, you know, I, I'm comfortable where I am. But there are challenges, you know, and it, it is. It, it, I am different to to most of my other colleagues, but I think that my knowledge, you know, it helps me. Uh, and that's why I can, and I, I'd like to think I can get my job done. Fantastic. Lundi, does any of that resonate or is your experience different? Quite, quite a bit of that resonates actually um, with Lorna Jane. Um, and I think um, it's, it's a really difficult question to answer. Uh, have always felt really, really different in terms of um, my other colleagues. And I think what's, what's helped is um, in terms of sort of, I guess, proving myself is, is, I guess, the expertise in terms of, of my job and having people, like, need me for certain things. Uh, I definitely think the, the football knowledge and, and being able to sort of talk about football um, does go a long way. Should it really be part of what we're doing? Probably not, but it does help. And I think um, it's definitely a level of authority that comes with whatever it might be that you're doing in your, in your field. So in my, um, in my HR role, 
um, I was definitely seen as a sort of disciplinarian and any time anybody saw me maybe around the training ground or anything like that it was sort of tells up which you know I don't think I'm scary um, but apparently um, some people find me intimidating um, and then similar to, to now uh, I think I'm, I'm trusted in terms of my role um, definitely wouldn't say it's easier because I'm a woman I do think it, it has its challenges because you are different especially with people who don't know you um, and I think it does take a, a bit of a while to, to build that rapport and to build that relationship with people. But I'd expect to be able to do that in any job anyway. Um, so actually, it's not, you know, it's not a scary thing. It's not a bad thing. It's not terrible. I'm not made to feel like I stand out all of the time um, because because of the clubs I've probably worked at and because of the people I've, I've worked with. Um, now, if you ask me about my experiences outside of, of my immediate clubs, those are probably very, very different in terms of actually really, really sticking out and actually being made to feel like you stick out. So, a real understanding of some of the barriers there, even though both of you are women who, you know, I have the privilege of knowing you both personally and know just how brilliant you are um, and you have done well in your careers, but I hear you loud and clear, it's, it's, there is a difference that's pointed out to you. I want to pick up on that word scary. As women, is that something that gets addressed to us, perhaps in a way that it doesn't get addressed to men? What do people think? I know, Monique, this is, is that something you've been accused of being scary? All the time. I, I, I think that I have been accused of being um, pushy. And I think I have been accused of being tenacious and pushing and keep on going for things. But if I were to answer you honestly, I would say that has been in reaction to having to feel like I'm working twice as hard to get half as listened to. And uh, so, so I may say something that I think is a really good uh, answer a really good persuasive case but I think for me I feel like I'm always having to give a doubly watertight business case even though I know I can communicate um, it, it, it's as if it's as if it, it's not enough just to have the skill to say it to be credible to be experienced to be skilled what I feel like is is that I have to dr drive my agenda home more and I think when that happens I think people might accuse me then of being scary, but actually I'm not being scary. I'm just having to fight for something I believe in, even though I know it to be true and appropriate and relevant and right. So, so it's often how I think you're perceived, not what's actually true. And perception is reality to some people. So if they, if they consider that a threat and you know they get that fight and flight mechanism going because of something I'm saying, I always feel like I'm the one that has to tone it down. They don't tone down what they're doing. I feel like I'm having to tone, tone down myself and mitigate my, my impact and effect in order to fit in with others. But I don't see others mitigating their effect to fit in with me. Yeah, no, I've, I've, I said all the time, and I think the interesting thing here is, is what all the, where all the intersections are, right? Because apart, let's start with the fact that I'm just quite noisy. And I don't realise I'm noisy a lot of the time. I grew up in a really noisy household and actually it was, and it was just noisy. And actually, um, and there might be, that might be something to do with being from an immigrant background. I don't know, but there was always loads of people and there was loads of shouting. And that's how the communication actually happened. No one was having an argument, but if somebody was from the outside looking in, they'd think there was a row, right? But there wasn't. Um, I also think I'm quite a big woman. And I think I take up quite a lot of physical space. And I think that people can find sort of scary or intimidating. I think because I'm a lesbian, people think, oh, the, you know, there must be something aggressive or aggro about me because I hate the world or I hate men or I hate whatever the things I'm, you know, you must be very hateful. And I, I think to Lungi's point, I think there's a lot of stuff around race there about what it means to, I mean, I don't want to talk for anybody else, but there's loads of tropes about what it means to be a black woman in, a, in any space. Um, and that sort of those concepts of being angry or, or intimidating and all the rest of it. So, you know, but and, and to Monique's point, I think if you are outside of whatever that norm is in business, which is usually a white, middle aged, heterosexual, cisgendered male, then you are other 
and that other is intimidating however it is however it's perceived i think gender stereotypes um limit us all so you go into that thing of like what it means to be a woman so do you have to um play a game of what it means to be a woman whether it's in in business um in w watching or participating in football you know and they're very different ger gender stereotypes in each of those things but if we don't conform then does that because we're then other does that make us scary probably i'm delighted i'm happy to be scary if that's what if that's what being scary is i'm i'm really up for it and i hope you'll all join me uh, do you know um chris i've had it too through my life I'm um, sure. you're scary you're intimidating and i learned to embrace it because the things that people were recognizing and which scared them i think you take the point it's their problem not mine they're the ones who need to change their attitudes not mine um, but I recognised those things were actually good things that I really enjoyed about myself and actually got me a long way in life. Um, I sometimes think, you know, maybe, maybe to my women in football colleagues, we, sh we should do a membership drive saying, if you have ever been accused of being feisty, scary, pushy, all these adjectives only women get, we're for you. I <laughs> think it's what it's scary, <laughs> pushy sisters. But anyway, we've got to bring in a man, I think. Can, um, I, oh, can I just make one point? I think what is yeah. important, though, is that I also spend a lot of time reflecting to ensure that I'm not, that there isn't actually anything that's affecting somebody else in my working yeah. practice. Because I think that's really important. Because what you can do is kind of feel like, oh, I just want to, you know, I'm going to be strident or whatever. But actually, you do have to understand the impact that you have on your colleagues and the people that you're working with. So I'll always make sure that I'm happy to sort of be noisy, have an opinion, make sure it's evidence based and all the rest of it, whilst also listening really carefully and being really kind. Sorry, Sandra, but just before you um, come in, I just wanted to kind of flip that around a little bit. So my background is uh, in football, I not started off, but in my early days, I was a receptionist. So I was, um, you know, the warm, welcoming, bunny, you know, person that, that everyone wanted to talk to. And then I became somebody else, you know, on the other side, you know, the angry black woman. And it, it was almost because each role, you have to have a, a, a different persona. You can't just be yourself. You have to change it every step of the way. So I had, I worked, I'd like to think I worked a little, very hard to change that smiley receptionist person. Not that there was anything wrong with it, but you, you just have to change who you are as you progress through your career, because you just don't want that to be stereotyped. That's the shame of it, isn't it? Why can't you be the smiley, kind, open, warm, generous person, but also boss it yeah. when you're doing like senior work? I think, um, sorry, Sanjay, I'm going to get you in. I just want to <laughs> <laughs> reflect on something I've been working on this afternoon, which is we're about to go out to advert um, for a, a new role. And um, I look very hard at what we say about diversity on it. Um, because I think a lot of those diversity statements that you see on job adverts, they're, they're just like boilerplate. That people just put them on, no one really reads them, they're stuck at the bottom in small print. And I thought, you, you, we've got to do it in a new way that's really authentic. So I read some great examples from other organisations and one of the phrases that really stuck, struck with me, and I thought says it all really well, is that like, like, we want we are an organization where if you come work for us you'll be comfortable being yourself your whole authentic yeah. self um, and i really love that so anyway listen we we do want to bring um sanjay in um you've heard some very powerful testimonies there from some women who've, who've worked in the game and campaigns in the game being activists in the game what's the world of gender equality looking like from your point of view in football, Sanjay? And bearing in mind also the critical question of intersectionality. Yeah, I mean, and I'm, I suppose I'm relatively new to the world of football for the last sort of 18 months and uh, and I'm chair of a chair of a quality chair. So we, <laughs> we're probably not the, the most representative of football because we're relatively representative of society. Uh, and we know that that's quite unusual. You know, <laughs> we're quite a mixed board. We're quite a mixed leadership team. We're quite a mixed team as a whole. Um, I, I know my, my 
sense from our sort of 30 years in a corporate career is that you know there's a there's a there's a model of leadership and there's a model of what we think a good leader looks like and i feel like i've been battling against that for the last 15 years trying to change it in very subtle ways and sometimes in just very brazen ways of saying this is the thing that's in your head that you're comparing everybody to that is what that's the model you think a good leader looks like and actually when you unpack those behaviors they're very you know the, the categories that chris talked about is the white white male straight cisgendered sort of uh, sort of sort of personality and the kinds of behaviors that we that we that we reward and that means that anyone who's outside of that, you know, and, and, and I'm, an, I'm, I'm a majoritarian in that I'm a man, but I'm in a minority because I'm Asian or, you know, and I'm in a minority because I came from a poor background and then, but, you know, there'll be other, but I'm in a majority because I'm straight and cisgendered. So we're all, a, we're all a little bit of everything, aren't we? We're not, no, none of us is just, is just one characteristic and and so sometimes i get some majority advantage and sometimes i get some minority penalty and for many of us we experience that dichotomy of those two different things but but one thing i do notice and i certainly noticed it in the corporate world and I, and my sense is football is behind where some of the other industries i've been in and so i expect it's it's playing out even more in in football uh it's also if you are female and you get to the top, what roles do you get? So if if, if I looked at the roles in my organisations, yeah, you might be head of finance, you might be head of ops, you might be head of HR. You're unlikely to be the CEO. You're unlikely to be in the really glamour markets and growth roles that get the highest pay. You're unlikely to be in the chief strategy officer role. All the really big ones that drive the organisation in a in a sort of the profit making direction, you are unlikely to be in those positions. If we so if we let you in, we let you have a place at the table, but it's still a second class citizen role as far as the CEO's concerned or the chair's concerned, because actually these are the people that bring matter. No, no matter how far you go, there's always another clique and there's always another ceiling to break, and so. I think you'll we'll find that there'll be more of those journeys. I want to see more female CEOs and more female, you know, heads of football operations. You know, I mean, football, those are the sorts of the, the big roles and the glamour roles. Those are the ones that drive the organisation forward and create the transformational change. And that's when we know that we're really making progress, when we get those icons at that level. We've got one or two, but not nowhere near enough. And the same for... You know, pe people like myself or, or other people from black, Asian or mixed heritage uh, backgrounds. So, uh, you know, I, th I think it is changing as society is changing. But my sense is it's 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 not changing as fast as I would like. And of course, if you want to get into one of those roles, we all do a little bit of covering and we all have to make our behavior look that little bit more like a white male. So we accentuate that bit of our character that looks a bit more like the model of leadership that we know that people are after. Uh, and, and that's a, a challenge for all of us that are doing that. So you know, it, I think you're right that that, that that ideal is creating the organisations where people feel completely comfortable being their truly authentic self. And the reality is for most of us, that only happens when you're a bit later in life, when you no longer care what other people think about you. You know, it's easy for me to say that because I'm in my 50s and I don't really care that much what other people think about me. But I really cared when I was in my 20s and 30s. I mean, it's a, it's a brilliant analysis. Thank you, Sandy. And I think we're all kind of clear about where we are now. What do we think? We I think we're also clear about where we want to get to and what we want football to, to look like. Um, what do we think the main blockages when it comes to gender diversity in football? And I think Sanjay makes a really good point about the football workforce is quite segmented in terms of the roles that women do. And there are examples, there are female CEOs of Premier League clubs um, and, you know, in, in some of those other, uh, you know, there's a director of football operations and the one, there are a few, but nowhere near 50-50, which is what it should be. So, so what do we think the main 
blockages which have prevented that so far? What one of the things that it's just football. I mean, if you take it from, you know, the bottom line, which is for us, it's game after game. It's it, it's we need results now. So um, unless you have a good strategic business plan in place of what you, you want and what you're trying to achieve, most clubs will just go for what they know has had a result in the past. And, and, and it's been clear to see. So, you know, you just you can go from club to club. You know, if, you, if you've been at a club where they've been relatively successful in whatever area it has been in, then you're likely to get another job at another cl club. And it, it's down to those clubs or organisations, leagues, to actually think outside the box and, and just not think about instant results because long term that, that doesn't often mean success. So Sorry, Jane. I was just going to say it's, it's not a priority. Uh, as Lorna says, it's something that's that's secondary constantly and there's always something else to worry about and I think unfortunately like Lorna alludes to football is very much about what's happening at the next game and even some of the really really well run clubs um, there's always a planning for the season rather than what are we doing three years from now what are we doing for th um, five years from now um, and I just think it, it's it's not a priority and it should be it absolutely should be because it will drive down, um, will drive up, I should say, that, that bottom line in terms of the, the commercial aspects that we care about within football, the results on the pitch, doing stuff differently, you know, those small margins, it would make a difference. But, but, but I think for the industry, it's not a priority. I also think that if you're an industry like football is, which is largely influenced by the networks and the little book you have, you will never expand your circle of influence or your circle of reach to take on new people and look at things in a different way. And the blockage is, if you do this little book and you're only looking at the little book, I, I, I just look at the last few managers that have been appointed of clubs and there have been a few positions going begging, haven't there, in the last 12 weeks and those people were quickly appointed and I'm pretty sure they didn't adhere to the FA leadership diversity code they just went for it um you know when is a woman going to be running a mouth mouth football team that I don't know when that's that's actually going to happen but uh, I think we've got some way to go and that's one of the core blockages so I, I completely agree with everyone but but I don't think this is necessarily just a football problem because mm. I think if you look at what Lungi, what Lungi was just saying about the short-termism you know, we all we know that a lot of corporates work quarter to quarter and you're just looking to kind of drive your bottom line for the next quarter. You do that enough times in a row, you can go and make more money somewhere else, which is the sort of the equivalent to to what Lorna was saying about, you know, about being results driven. And actually what you're talking, and this is a big thing, you're talking about shifting entire cultures. We started this conversation talking about gender stereotyping and how it kind of limits us all. Well, actually, we're not just talking about changing football. You have to do all sorts of things. You have to change the media representation of us. You have to fund childcare properly. You have to have better education. So we're not pushed into these stereotypes so early into, you know, so early into life. You have to fix the pay gap. I mean, I could go on. So, and, but you know, football is a microcosm of all of this. And we also talk about this a lot. How about for how football can be the leader? Why not? It's our national game. It's a passion that the majority of the country has and people understand it. It's a shortcut to understanding all sorts of things. So football should be leading here, not lagging behind. Andre, what do you think about that? I think, I think it's a fascinating question. How much does football lead society and how much does it follow it? So we've seen, for example, the, one of the strongest voices of moral authority over the past year by far has been Marcus Rashford. A great example of, I wouldn't say football actually, but an individual footballer giving true leadership. That wider question, should, should, should football really step out to, to set an example to other sectors of the country and, and use its privileged position of having a lot of interest, a lot of media coverage in a positive way? 
Yeah, I think it's the, the, the opportunity is always there in football because of the iconography of football. And that's the, the reality is that when something happens in football, you create this massive icon on a pedestal. And in actually in the same way, it can be iconoclastic. You can knock things down with football because you're going to do something first in an increasingly secular society in something which is something approaching in our national religion. It's either football or the NHS. Right. These are the two things that kind of everyone in the UK believes in. And so it has the, that that's why Marcus Rashford can have the impact that he does. Uh, and actually, this is one of those areas where something like social media is actually a positive boon, because without that, you know, the individual icons wouldn't have that direct link to in, to people and to be able to connect to their hearts really that's what he does he connects directly to what people feel um so football has an enormous opportunity um in terms of if you're asking me to diagnose it where is it in comparison to other industries yeah it's got a fantastic opportunity but partly it's got a fantastic opportunity because it's already behind other industries and of course so it's got a massive runway of place to places to grow um, so I, I see other industries and, and that, that certainly I've been in in the in the, in the past uh, are ahead in that journey. Uh, you know, have appreciated the challenges with closed networks, are changing recruitment practices, are setting targets. Look, we're we're on the way. Things like the football leadership diversity code and the fact that forty eight clubs have signed up to it. That's really massive. It's really important because you never get anywhere in any business without setting targets. It's not enough. It's necessary, but not sufficient. You need to set that destination. What we now need to do is, is navigate our way to that destination. And that's all the other things that need to be done, the infrastructure to ensure that you get there. But that, those targets have to be kind of baked in to the organizational requirements. So that's when you'll start getting you know, more women around the senior leadership table, more women in coaching, more ethnic diversity in, in coaching and senior leadership. You know, it's, it's only when it really matters to people, as that's certainly my experience, when you've tried to, when we've been in other organisations, we've tried to change things for social justice reasons, it never worked. It just never worked. We had six years going nowhere. As soon as we made the business case and it was about performance, then, then suddenly it worked. Uh, and and you start opening yourselves up to getting better people. Um, I, I, I think that, and I'm sure some football clubs are on the way there, but many aren't, uh, is my suspicion. Well, we'll come on to talk about some of the things that Paul is doing a little later, but I, I, think, I think it's good to just talk about where we think football as a whole is in terms of, is it changing? Is it getting better with regard to women? Does it want to change, but it doesn't know how? Are, are some people saying they're changing, but they're not really? It's a little bit of lip service, a little bit of tick box. A lot of organizations want to talk to us. A lot of clubs want to talk to us, and that's great. That's great. Um, I am sensing from those who do come and knock on the, our door a genuine desire to change. It's, it's not just tick box. It's not just because they're getting pressure to do it or they've got codes that they've signed up to. It's genuine. They don't always know how. And, and I, I kind of appreciate their honesty. They, they don't know how to do it and they really need help to change. But it's not everyone. I think the change is happening, but it's too slow is probably how I'd, I'd sum it up. But what does everyone else think? Where is football on? Is it changing? Does it want to change? So one of the things if you don't mind, I, um, I've experienced is, I think it's fantastic for people to see or other clubs to see the input of women or of anyone. And, you know, I not always wanted to put myself forward for anything in the public eye, but when I have done, I've, I've seen the benefits and more broadly so I think that whether you know not necessarily me but just if people can see that if you add something a little different to your club your organization there could be a benefit to it I think it's it's something that 
other clubs need to, to see. They don't want to jump in with two feet and say, OK, we're going to take a chance here on doing something a little bit different. Whereas, you know, sometimes that's what needs to be done for there to be an impact. Jane, Jane I, think, I think you're right in terms of um, there are clubs out there that, that want to change. The change is very, very slow. And I think we have to think about the types of clubs and we, we have to think about what we mean when, when we say football. Obviously, especially in England, football is massive and it, it, it goes from um, obviously the Premier League in terms of being that top step right down to, to step nine, you know, and, and even further in terms of grassroots. Now, when you talk about those clubs who have been proactively reaching out to say, actually, we, we want to do something, we really do want to do something. I think you have to think about sort of their, their profile. They've got a global presence. They have a, a lot more of a corporate function. Um, and I think the trouble you have with, with football clubs, probably even in the championship, actually, I can probably name some clubs in the championship who are still lagging behind in terms of how they're run. Uh, clubs are very traditional and actually are very, very um, anti-change just because it's the unknown. And I think that that's really going to stand in our way in terms of trying to progress things. You've obviously got the FA trying to lead the way in terms of being um, our governing body and, and being the, the caretakers of the football country. But I, I think it's a real challenge when you've got those clubs who are standing up and being a beacon of light, because obviously they've either got the resource, they've got the, the know-how um, and they've also got the desire, but then there isn't very much follow-up. And I think it, that that probably makes things um, very, very challenging. And what you then have is those people who are falling up, um, behind then form the majority and um, it then leaves us in, in the same place, I think. I think there's something, um, I think that's, that's absolutely true. But I also think that um, what it feels like, there's no, there aren't many women trailblazers in, in, in football. And if there are, they're not noticed in quite the same way, unless they've got really good male allies backing them and speaking for them. So, for instance, I consider Sanjay to be a male ally, absolutely, 100%. I would pick up the phone and have a conversation with him, like I would most people, and he would answer my call. And I'm always pleased when he does, because it, what it feels like is there's no barrier to us having a, a conversation. We can talk about everything from cats to football, and we're, and we and we and we're comfortable doing that, and that is great. So cats, Jane, we talk about cats as well, Sanjay and I. So that's a that's a good one. That Jane, Jane understands that from me. Um, the secret of most football administrators is that we're all massive. Yeah, anyway, abso absolutely. <laughs> but I would say, for instance, if I look at Brentford, I would say my one of my closest uh, male allies is to to something. It's Nissi Raj, you know, and he absolutely understands. And I will tell you why he understands. He understands because he comes from an ethnically diverse background. He is diverse. I am diverse. I am gender diverse. I also am of a different religion as well. But he understands. So in a way, we stand together. He says, well, what, what's your journey? How can I help you on your journey? So he's he's a he's a really good male ally. And John Varney's become a great male ally as CEO because he's he's gone on his own personal journey of understanding what diversity is and the imperative of, of it, both personally and from a business point of view. So he's understood it. Cliff's been, the chairman's been a sort of male ally, but in a different way. They've all been there. But what it feels like is still, you can't step out unless you've got that platform of a male ally. And until we can stand alone without having the male ally, we won't actually change in football. So I think there's something in there, which is, which is, can we do this? Can, can we be on our own? I, I don't want to be asked anymore, how did I get that job when I become a non-exec director? I just don't want to do that. I, I'd like, really like someone to stop asking me that question. When they do, I know that we would have progressed. Just see me as a person who's got, you know, 30 plus years of really great experience. And that's why I'm a non-exec director, because I can, I can give you something that perhaps my male counterpart couldn't actually do. So there's, there's, my, there's my dilemma. I don't, I think we're not changing quick enough, as Lungi says, we're, I think it's the same, by the way, in corporate. I think Chris is, is right on that. And I think we change at the appetite of society. Um, and when society will change, then, then we change too. But I think it's harder in football because I still think it comes with that view that if you, how can you understand football if you're not a woman? How can you truly understand football if you're not a woman? The fact that I've been going since I've been five years old has got nothing to do with it. And I, you know, I know the game, I know the game well. 
So I think there's a lot of blocks there. And um, I think we've moved, but not quite at the pace I would have liked us to have moved. Let's talk about allyship. This is such an interesting concept. I think you've explained the, what, you know, how powerful male allyship can be on gender. Allyship, I think, again, we think about intersectionality applies across um, other protected characteristics. I, as a white leader, have had to do a lot of thinking, reflecting and learning about how can I be a good ally um, and anti-racist in, in my actions. And that's been a, a, a fascinating journey for me. I think we all, would I be right in saying, do you agree with this? We know, we know like that, we know instinctively when someone is our ally, we can feel it, we can feel their authenticity. I'm still yeah. having heads. Yeah. Uh, for me, Gordon, go for it. <laughs> so during my career, I, I mean, I can I can name them, but I won't embarrass them. Actually, I might name them. So there's a few that I've met along along the way that have, have helped me get through, whether it's situations, given me advice for my career, and it, it's these are the people people will know are either constantly pushing for equality and diversity so paul barber at brighton you know he's been an ally of mine every you know we, the girl, everyone's nodding here because we know what work he's done des moxie david sheepshanks you know years ago these are these are people that i've met in my journey on my journey and have helped me get to you know a position where I, i'm comfortable with what i'm saying and what i'm doing i've taken advice from them and you know these are these are people that you need in what well, i've needed i'm not saying necessarily saying you know everyone's needed these people but without them having a level of understanding you know how do, i wouldn't have been able to, to have some conversations to get to you know to, to get to a position where i'm happy with having conversations myself so, uh, Riz, Sanjay, what do you think allyship looks like? What's the qualities of a, a good ally? I think, I mean, it, it seems obvious, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to slightly answer the question differently rather than thinking about qualities, but we have to... Sorry, it's, it, it's a really obvious, it is an obvious point, but it can't be us. So the most effective things that I, that I find if someone is being an ally to me, particularly if it's around LGBTQ plus stuff, and I'm talking, you know, maybe let's talk about social media for a second. You know, we get trolled on social media all the time and I've stopped responding. But what's even more impactful is when other Spurs fans respond, straight Spurs fans respond, you know, blokes respond and say enough with your nonsense misogyny enough with your terrible homophobia etc and that seems and that's really blunt because social media is very blunt and that's a really blunt thing to a blunt example to use but that's the stuff that matters because that's when we're gonna that you know we're talking about mate we've been talking about making change that's when you make the change is when you're moving you know if you're trying to if you're looking at lgbtq plus lib liberation you're moving your um the, your heterosexual sort of um, friends and colleagues and the heterosexual community to act on your on on your behalf to say this isn't good, you know. In the same way that you know, as a white person, I like you know, I don't want to. It's not about trying to save anybody. I think that's the other thing is you can tell when someone's trying to be a savior and say, "Don't worry, I'm here. I've got it. Let me sort it out." Because you can tell when there's a man doing that. You can tell when there's a white person doing that. You can tell when there's a very woke straight person doing that as well um and i guess that goes then to your, your question of of what the qualities are then then jane and i think authenticity is a really difficult thing to really put your finger on but i think we can all we can all smell it you can always you can smell when someone's intentions are the right intentions and sometimes people get things wrong they might say the wrong thing but I'm not interested in policing people's language or anything else. If you can feel that the authenticity is there, and it's not for their own, it's not for their own gains or to or to show something. And I think, you know, what's interesting from a from a football perspective is how do we do that collectively, so we're allies for each other. Um, 
and that's what I think is interesting because you know we, we, we're coming at this from a lot, lots of us from just sort of different angles and I, I think collectively how can how can we in, in football be good allies for each other to make that change yeah, I, I think so I, I suppose I have two perspectives on it where where have I needed good allies for for you know because I'm in a minority as well and have been in in other in in other businesses and what what have I what have I looked for from from my allies and then actually it, it, how do I become a conscious ally myself and what what are those behaviours and how do I turn that intent into action and so yeah what do I look for I, I look for that authenticity I look for that someone who's genuinely interested because I could tell someone who's trying to tick a box and say you're my you're, you're my friend from the north aren't you you're my brown friend you're my whatever you know I can you can see that you can smell that a mile off and I I don't give those people the time of day but I can see people who are actually genuinely interested and what I'm a after is someone who's listening and trying and listening to understand not listening for the gaps for, for when they can tell me the answer um and then i suppose uh i, I don't know it's a, I, I would never categorize myself so it's not it would be great to be regarded as an ally but i think more importantly is just trying to be a decent human being and help other people i mean the thing that i get you know most out of life actually in many ways is the people i've mentored you know i've done loads of amazing projects in my life and i can't remember any of them but i can remember everyone i've helped and i can remember all the people i've mentored and all the people i'm still in touch with and they're still coming back and asking for advice and i'm, I'm doing a talk later on today for a firm i started to work for in 1990 and one of the people at the team just sent me an email someone's joining i'm an alumni event and someone's joining it saying oh i was sanjay's trainee 20 years ago and he taught me this and i remembered it you won't remember it. i do remember her. i do remember she was my trainee i do remember her. and uh, but it's that, that sort of thing i love that that's the the best feeling in the world is when you you're helping somebody else but that would have been unconscious when i was doing that 20 30 years ago what i started to do was how am i going to do it consciously so for me, it was right. There was a point at which I decided, well, actually, I'm only going to mentor women, and so I had no male mentees, I had no male sponsors. I only ment mentored females, and that was because we had a priority to get more women into the partnership. And so I said, well, all the white men have already got men mentors, and they've already got sponsors, and they don't need them. Actually, where can I have the greatest marginal impact? Well, why don't I spend time with people who I think have got potential and try and help them mentor them to where they where they need to be next or where they want to be next? So, th there is a conscious decision to do something, but also to yeah to to to, to, to think about the impact you're having and who you're going to be spending time with. I think that's really important as you know try in trying to be an ally is thinking where you spend your time and who you spend your time with because my experience you know previously was I'd, i never had a shortage of very confident white men telling me why i should sponsor and mentor them i never had a shortage of them coming and asking me but i had to go and ask the black people or the asian people or the women they wouldn't come and ask me i had to go and ask them Do can you i just help? sorry just just on that one of the interesting things that come to mind and I'm, i don't know if lungi might agree with me so i been a mentor and um, try to reach out and, and support um, other young black females that want to be involved in the game. And what I have found is if they have tried to or, or gone on to do something, if they have um, been mentored by myself, the assumption is they're going to be similar to me. Whereas <laughs> it, it doesn't necessarily mean the case because you wouldn't make that assumption with a white man mentoring a, another young white man. So if they may not have been successful for any for any particular reason, it may reflect on me, which is just such a, a, a bad situation to be in. I mean, and Lungi's laughing as we speak because it it because when I have introduced other black women and got you know I do hope and I know some of them have been really successful but that one that hasn't been it, it reflects on me and it's it's so sad that that has been the case so I, I can definitely 
see where Lorna's coming from. And I think for me, it's been it's been on the reverse end, where um, if someone has advocated for me, and it's normally other women, and I'm really conscious of actually not letting that person down, and um, being really conscious of, of not failing that person and how that person is viewed. And I think on the, on the subject of, of, of allyship, um, most of my allies, if not all of them, have been female. And I find that quite interesting, actually. Um, and I think in terms of um, that, I've always had, because I've always had men in, in leadership um, roles, I guess, I guess view me with some some precaution. And I don't know why, um, but, but I've always had um, female allies who have always been really, really encouraging. And I, and I don't think I'd be where I am today without them. And I definitely regard people like Monique, people like Jane, in, in, in terms of that um, and I think in terms of the qualities that, that, that we need for those people it's just somebody who's, who's really supportive um, really op genuinely opens the, the door for you genuinely pushes you to do things that you think actually that's probably not for me um, obviously shares in, in that empathy um, and not necessarily um, sympathy which I think you, you, you find sometimes where people are sort of either make an excuse for you um, or, or, or anything like that. And I think authenticity definitely goes a long way with that. Um, but yeah, I think I'll, I'll pro I've probably got m more male allies now in, in the one or two that I've got than I've ever had before, um, which I find quite, quite, quite interesting. Could I just, could just quickly add though, I, and I hope I'm not taking the conversation too much in a different direction, but. I also think that when you're talking about allyship and mentoring and all those kinds of things, they're very individual. And actually a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, there are structural inequalities, whether it's structural um, gendered inequalities or structural racial inequalities, you know, that no amount of mentoring or allyship is going to unpick. Because we've just talked about, you know, exactly what Lorna's just discussed. It's like, in what universe is it possible that, you know, because she's met the one, per one person out of the 27,000 that she's mentored doesn't, doesn't necessarily succeed, that somehow that's a reflection on her. You wouldn't dream of it, as we said earlier, if it was a, a white, heterosexual, cisgendered man. Not in a million years. You, no one would even make the connection. And those are kind of deep structural things that, and those are things kind of culturally that we also need to be unpicking because no amount of allyship or mentoring programs is gonna uh, is gonna fix those. Not to say that they're not, that's not good, it has to go hand in hand with the big stuff. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think, I think we mustn't kind of enter the danger of putting the onus on the individual exactly. to be responsible exactly. for sorting out their own development and advancement yes we all need to work on ourselves right cool. i've had to i still am you know never be perfect it'll never be a finished job i've got to keep working on it um but we mustn't underplay you know i was actually talking to someone today about imposter syndrome and and monique and lungi will agree with me here we, we meet this a lot in the women we work with who are women working across football a lot of them lack self-belief a lot of them lack self-confidence and we do a lot of work with that in our courses and our coaching um and someone gave me a, a different perspective on it which is like you know what maybe it's not that it's not the person it's the system they're in that is the thing, and I think this is, again, let's talk about intersectionality. This can be particularly the case for black and brown women. They've lived in a world which has treated them for years as second class, and which has told them for years they're second class. So if people begin to, I can't imagine, you know, as a white person, what that is like to, to have to live your life like that. I just can't imagine it. So, and. I think there's a similar point about mentoring as well. Mentoring is great and has its place. And I've both been a, a mentee and a, a mentor. And I actually believe everyone, whatever stage of their career they're at, should be both. You should always, you know, if you're a chair like Sanjay or a CEO like me, you should still be a mentee, find a mentor. But men mentoring does place the onus on the individual. So it should always be kind of part of the package. Individuals need more as well. They do need allyship. They need sponsorship. They need that senior person who's got an eye out for them, who can nominate them and advocate for them to get the interesting projects and the, the development opportunities. So when, going back on that, I think, um, like you say, being categorised and, and, and put, in, put in a box 
through the, a lot of my career. I mean, I, I have often myself just seen past that, and, and but sometimes it's actually there and, and pointed out, and it's down to others to say, you know, I, I, I've had others that have said to me, you know, almost ignore over that, all of that, you know, I'm. I'm as a teenage mother, I've got two children, you know, and being a mother, black, in an environment that, that I, I was different to a lot of other people around me. But going back to, to having the allies t saying to you, almost saying to me, ignore all of that, that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But I carried it with me, believing that it did because I'd been told that it, it, it mattered. And I, I thought that it did and suddenly like i say when, when you realize that it doesn't matter none of that matters it's what what i can do and offer the industry and that's that's what i chose to do i really like us to talk about solutions okay and i think we've had some great ones lorna talked about the power of role models and showcasing your people um, and saying to the world that you are an organisation that celebrates diverse talent and not just celebrates, nurtures it properly, looks after your people. We've talked about allyship, we've talked about mentoring, strengths and weaknesses. What are some of the other solutions people think? So one of the things that, well, Monique will probably go through it better than I will, but um, I'm going to talk about Brentford and what we're doing and, and how we looking to recruit and the the thing about widening the net we, we've spoken about so much and it, it, for me we, we've done it uh, I'd, I'd say there's two projects that we I've, I've been involved in and it's just seeing recruitment done properly that's what i think is just it's just so, so refreshing for for us to do it and i think that clubs really need to adopt that the mentality, the processes, because th that it, it's a step, but you can't. Um, it, it's immeasurable when you, you actually see the results and how well it works if you do it properly at the very start. Mm -hmm. you say, Monique. I have totally. You, you 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 put it really well. I think recruitment is is definitely one of the angles you've got to look at. Um, and I think if you do that properly, it, it just gets embedded in the DNA of what you do on a regular basis. I think there's a more personal angle of what needs to change, and I think that's self-awareness. And I, I, for me, it's it's about when I speak to somebody, are they truly listening? Sanjay referred to it before, not listening for the gaps, just listening to understand, seek first to understand old Stephen Covey principles of the seven habits of highly, highly effective people. I've never forgotten that from the 80s, seek first to understand. And I would love to talk to people where it, where they are truly listening to the experience. Because honestly, sometimes I'm exhausted. I feel exhausted. I get to the end of the day and I feel, here we go again. And I feel like I've pushed hard and done the things I do. And then someone said to me once when I was out for drink, don't push. I went, oh my God, you don't understand. If I don't push, it doesn't happen. And they said, well, perhaps it will. And I said, no, 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 you, you don't. You don't. You, you, it doesn't happen because you have to keep pushing because until you, it's like the domino effect. Until you actually have somebody that stands in front of you, that actually truly listens with their whole being to what you're saying, to who you are, to understanding your experience, nothing will change. And I have to do the same with others. It's, it's not just about them doing it to me. It's about me doing it, it to others. So I think there is an understanding of a male privilege in a scenario, just like there's an understanding of when I'm white and I'm speaking in a room with people who aren't like myself, you know, who come from more diverse backgrounds, I have to understand what I am, where, where I'm privileged, I'm in the majority, therefore I wouldn't face the different things that they face. So I would like it that when I stand with a man in that situation, or I stand with someone who's different from myself, and actually they seek first to understand what my experience is and then they can truly engage like I will truly engage with them if they're in a different experience so rather than you know it, it's your right to educate me you know it's my right to go out and be educated about why it's different it's not about you know you have to tell me I have to take the responsibility and go and find out for myself and only then will it change so if when I'm when you know when I say I'm exhausted and I feel like I'm you know pushing it a hill up ever you know pushing a big big ball up everest 
somebody understands why it feels exhausting. And by the way, it's not like that all the time. You know, sometimes it's good and it's fun and it's successful and things work and it's great. But I just want people to hear. And if they hear, that's and in those places, I think the change will come. Jane, I think there's a lot to be said um, for, for pipe, the pathways and, and creating the, the pipeline in terms of, of that diverse talent. And I think we refer to it quite a lot in academy football from the boys' side. Um, and actually where you recruit goes a long way. You have um, clubs who are based on the South Coast, clubs who are based in the North, setting up um, satellite recruitment centres, sat satellite training centres in inner city London, where they know the talent is and they want to um, breed that talent and they want to nurture that talent in order for, for them to, to transfer to, to their clubs. And actually you need to apply that to, to the workforce as well. You know, we, we look to universities for interns um, but what happens there? Because the technical side of football is is very samey. Um, those people recruit the same people as them. But there's a lot to be said for um, for challenging your biases, and um, I don't think we do enough of that in terms of, of of challenging our biases, in terms of being really really aware of those unconscious biases and making sure that they don't stand in the way of, of what you're doing for for your organisation. Um, I think you have the same thing within the, the women's game with, um, with football and the participation levels of um, Southeast Asian women, of, of black women. Um, we run an RTC and a, and a girls academy at Birmingham City and um, there's no reflection there of, of what the population in the West Midlands looks like, what the population in Birmingham looks like. And that's because those opportunities aren't there and we're closed off to um, a whole host of, of, of a society. And I think in terms of the solution and the change, we're not going to see it for another decade or longer, but we have to obviously do the work now. And it's similar to being really, really comfortable with hiring um, in terms of your hospitality, your, your, your catering divisions, hiring black women, because you know they're going to work hard, you know they're going to do the job for you, you know they're going to get you what you need in terms of the customer facing role, but actually not trusting them to then be the head of a department or whatever it might be, hiring them to, to work in your ticket office, hiring them to, to work in your event space, but actually not nurturing that talent in terms of development and actually getting them to that next stage where they are either supervising head of a department or um, leading multiple departments and, and, and that's where we're probably getting it wrong in terms of once people are in the door how are we nurturing them how are we making sure that they're included how are we making sure that that talent actually doesn't go to waste and it's lost to somebody else because they've got those characteristics but we don't want to nurture them it's not just so recruitment is key but it's not just about recruitment that's just the start because you want it, I, I mean again you the millions of recruitments in your time Lungi and you know and we all of us know how much time and effort goes into it you don't want to make that investment of time and resource only for the person not to turn out the right hair because you haven't done it right or because you're not looking after them well and they leave or whatever I get that um Sanjay from your perspective what do you think needs to change in order to help women in the game and in order to drive greater diversity in the game generally? I think it's about system change. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a broken system. And so you, 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 all of the suggestions that I've heard are all, are all completely valid and are all part of the answer. If I think about um, where change has been driven elsewhere, I think, I think of, you know, sort of, five or six things that, that need to be done. I think you have to you have to set targets. You'll never get anything done unless you set targets because every business, every organization operates on the things that get measured. And if it gets measured, it gets done. And if it conversely, if it doesn't get measured, it won't get done. So you need to set those targets and set the pat the you know, the plant the flag to say this is where we're heading to. I, th I think then it's all the other mechanical things to make to, to help you to hit those targets. So it's differentially investing in your high potential talent that you already have it's you know if you if you want to have an inclusive team you don't actually get the benefits of a diverse team unless your current leaders know how to lead inclusively so you've got to change their mindsets and get them to learn how to lead inclusively because if you've got the same people leading a different bunch of people 
that it's not, it's not going to work either. Uh, and the same people with the same mindset. So you've got to change their mindsets as well. You know, oh, I love the data. It's all about your baseline data and your benchmark data, tracking all the way through your pyramid, understanding where your cliff edges are, where you're losing people, when you lose people, understand why you're losing them, you know, the exit interviews, understand therefore you know where the barriers might be inside your organization and then nearly always at you know organizationally for any anyone anyone however big or complex or ever ever small there's a middle management layer that's a kind of permafrost layer because they're normally the ones that have all of the kpis and so you're adding another kpi to them and they're thinking how important is that compared to all the other things that i have to manage so you have to constantly communicate in lots of different ways how important this is to the organization because if you don't communicate how important it is to the organization no one will change they'll just think well it's yet another initiative and i don't have to do anything um it's not just recruitment i think it's performance evaluation and promotion because all those other things all of that that ecosystem around hr where you need to be baking this kind of stuff in. What's your model of leadership? What do you think good looks like? And does that look a bit more like sort of male white characteristics than it does other characteristics? So the, the most common things I used to say in round tables and evaluation was someone would describe someone and say, well, they would, wouldn't they? If you were from their background, you'd behave exactly the same as they do. Um, uh, and then, you know, ultimately, then the, you, you have to you have to celebrate your role models, the ones that do make it through and they're, you know, whether and, and, and for them to know you are a role model, you know, whether you like it or not, you're a role model because other people will see you as a role model. It's not actually your choice to be a role model. It's other people's choices. And I'm just going to explain to you, for all of you on this call, you're all role models, whether you like it or not, you are. And other people will see you that way. So as this kind of the sooner you accept that, the sooner actually you're able to use that positively to influence and to uh, so it's to share your story and share your success because it is, it is the classic as Raheem Sterling said, you know, you can't if you can't see it, you can't be it, and it's it's absolutely true. So, you know, if you are it and you're all part of that it, you've got to kind of you've got to go and go share your stories even more. And I think just to add that I know there's a lot of other black women, women um, that are at other clubs and, and, you know, they're just going into their jobs and doing their jobs very well and don't necessarily want to be in the limelight or, or, or be celebrated. I wish they would, you know, they're, they're, I do know some of them, but they, they just want to, to get on with their job. And that the sad thing about that is unless other women can see us they're not going to think it's for them and we really need to, to make it clear that it is for them i think you're right i think I'll take your point Kranje, that we're, we're going to be looked at right and oh choose role models and think whereas you know internally i feel just still that that flat and tumbling frankly and always will but it has to be the individual's choice i think to the extent whether they mm -hmm. um they take that mantle on. I, Could I just I, add something to this question, Jane? I just, I think the one thing that we, we haven't really touched on is like the biggest community of people in football are the fans. And, you know, fans have changed in the last 20, 25 years. Um, there are more women who are football fans. Um, but I do think there needs to be some deliberate action <laughs> there as well, because, you know, we don't always see ourselves. And I think probably for a black woman, you definitely don't see yourself represented from a football fan perspective. And there are, you know, plenty of, of women of all race and ethnicities who are football fans. And actually that inclusion is really, really important. And whether it's about seeing yourself or whether it's about what the, again, what the structural conditions are that can allow you to participate in the same way. It sounds really obvious, but it's, you know, when I first started going to football, it was the mid nineties. And I said something one game and one, and it was about some sexism that I'd heard, right? Cause you know, even I talk about the mid nineties, even now it's perfectly laughed off in a way that um, other forms of discrimination are not. It's acceptable to be sexist. But I said something in the mid nineties and a, this man turned around to me and said, 
Oh, pack it in, love. That's why I get out of the house to not have to listen to nonsense like that or something of that effect. Because very much so, that's it's you know it's where you go to get away from the your the day to day tribulations of your life. It's what sort of traditionally what football was. It was what men went to do together, and you know, and that has changed. You know, you only have to look around you um, in a football match. You only have to look at the look on social media who's talking about what you know. It's 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 there are there are definitely more women participating in that sense. But while cas casual sexism is laughed off while um death and rape threats on social media are sort of not brushed off but not taken as seriously as they could it's like oh well it's just a keyboard warrior that's serious stuff right um you know while we and while we still kind of continue to live in these systems of of um you know where education we we where we, there's those gender stereotypes are perpetuated again and again and again even in 10, 2021 so that's the stuff we need to do we need to start early we need to try and confound those gender stereotypes we need to make sure that we can see ourselves as participants and stakeholders in the game and we need to make sure that that sexism and misogyny is challenged like vehemently as something that's not acceptable in our game I think um, there's a few things in there. I, the, the social media piece, I mean, actually, Sanjay brought women in football in, great example of allyship to some discussions across football, uh, discussions happening on, on social media. And um, it's it, that, I think that could be a whole other webinar, yeah. right? But, but hopefully, the social media companies are move, will move on that because, again, you cannot put that on the individual. To, to take the action against it, to mute, to block, mm -hmm. to do this, that and the other. I, I like the what you said, another point you made about how, well, actually, this is a question I took from it. I don't want to put words in your mouth. This might not be quite how you said it, Chris, but it made me think, how do we build more diverse fan bases? Yeah. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to throw that one at Monique because obviously you know Brentford you've been doing some work on that I I couldn't you know let me just say by the way Brentford Football Club and everybody who works there what it must be like to kind of close a beloved iconic old stadium and open a new one in a global pandemic i'd absolutely take my hats off to you so but monique this is you, brentford uh, do you want to talk a little bit about brentford's approach to this and, and building the fan base and the diverse fan base yeah thank you uh, and uh, i'm sure lorna would have come in and kevin's was in the background here as well and uh, look we we live in one of the most diverse communities in the whole of london you know i think the the, the current ons statistics are that between I think it's 52 and 57 percent of the population of Hounslow is uh, from ethnically diverse backgrounds. And by the way, that is there are different there are all different communities in there. You know, there's Somalian and there's Polish and there's Afghanis and there's lots of lots and lots of different um, people. I could name 20 different um, fan groups. But the the thing is, is in order to attract them, I think there are a couple of things that you have to you have to do. Is one you have to show that you're like them. You have to see it to be it. I know, not, 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 you know, Lorna talks about this a lot. If you don't see that, you know, how do you want to be attracted to it? So why would you take the leap and come and sit in a stadium, which is largely white male, you know, do you feel safe coming in? So actually it's, it's not on them to come in and feel safe. It's about us to go and create the conditions for them feeling safe. So it's to go in to reach into those grassroots organizations, those people that play football, that love football, but also want some sort of community um, cohesion and sense of community cohesion and um, to want to engage with a club because it's a, it, it's a club that, that, that takes care of its community, it's community engaged. So I think it's on us to actually go out and seek those communities. Um, and I know that Kevin's doing a lot of work and one of the strategy, part of our strategy is to go in and actually go and find those groups, go and seek those groups of people and look at ways that coming to be with us as a club makes great sense for them as, 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 as community partners, as, as engaging with a club that wants to go somewhere, as progressive and truly wants to be inclusive. 
it is a quid pro quo. You don't just go and say, come and spend some money and buy a season ticket. What do we, what can we give them? What's their, what's their path to belonging with us? So going out and engaging with fans is a really conscious action. It's a really conscious inclusion action. It's like understanding all that demographic, what it means to uniquely engage with that demographic, find a way to do that via the players, the trust, the foundation, us as a group of people, and then give them that experience and bring them in. So, uh, and we're on that. And it's hard, as you're right, you rightly acknowledged, in a pandemic opening a stadium. I mean, who, who would have funked like that, eh? Um, but actually, we're, we're doing it and we're going to do it and we, we're going to keep doing it. And again, we've got amazing allies of people around, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I, I speak to Anwar, you know, of, of you know, the, well, you, you know that, Chris. I was I've spoke about to mention Fans for Diversity, actually, because that's exactly the work that Fans for Diversity, yeah. which is a campaign, joint campaign between Kick It Out and the Football Supporters Association. It's exactly the work that they go out there and do it. If you haven't, if you've got a spare 10 minutes, I think, on YouTube, there's a wonderful film that they made, which was what they called like a cultural exchange between um, the Bangla Bantams and I think it was the Bangla Bantams. I'm going to get it wrong. No, the Bangla Bantams and Lady Imps. Lady Imps in Lincoln. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Amazing. Um, and they got them all together to, and they went to each other's games and yep. so the Lady Imp supporters made samosa before a game, before they went to a Bradford game. And then they went down to Lincoln and went to like a, um, I think an, an RAF museum, all went to a game together. And it's just like a massive bunch of women who have not necessarily either been engaged with football or with each other before, who like, love the football and love that sort of being there together. So, um, you know, that's exactly what you can do, but you have to be deliberate about it because I don't feel those spaces that they belong in those spaces. It's creating that condition where they can engage with you because you find that that connection, that point where they want to do it. So and I think it, it, it's research. Sorry, Monique, let me come in because I know Sanjay wants to, to, to jump off shortly. And I'd just like to ask him and Lungi, you've heard the work Brentford are doing. Um, do you think that's... Um, do you think other clubs are doing similar work? Do you think it's a priority for other clubs? Do you think Brentford are leaders um, with this? Where do you think other clubs are on this? Or does it depend on, what, on, on the club and where they're based or whatever? My, my sense is there's a, there's a few clubs that have got some similar initiatives in terms of you know, some, of the, some of the things that, that Chris talked about, really, you know, some of the, the, the groups through fans for diversity so i know birmingham city have got blues for all and yeah. and mick and bick who took part in the in the recent uh mick and richards documentary so yeah the, i think there's and there's a few of those uh, uh fan groups around the country and it's it's kind of starting to become a thing in the way that fanzines became a thing in the late 80s and early 90s it's becoming a thing and that that's all, almost always the best way that change happens lasting change comes from the grassroots not really from top down um i think what brentford are doing is ta just tapping into something that's already happening i think that's the bit that's different is that consciously tapping into something that's already happening uh, and and that is something that's different and that's just you know that brentford may well be in the vanguard there in terms of tapping into something that's happening at a sort of grassroots level but i think once you know the reality is in in any industry the first mover advantage is relatively short-lived these days so you know other clubs will be doing that i'm sure i'm sure i was going to mention um blues for all who, who are doing a fair amount just in terms of engaging the the local community and we, we try and help them with as much as we can in terms of what they need um but it's very much fan-led and i think that's how it should be they are obviously engaged with the club, um, but the club, in terms of any real sort of initiatives, are we're probably left wanting, I think, and it's probably easier to sort of delegate that that element of things in terms of letting them do that and letting them get on with it. Um, there's definitely probably more we could be doing in terms of, of engaging with, with our with our local community, um, and I think there's probably other groups that could could also be there. I think. The other thing with, with clubs, and um, they're obviously private entities, they, they go through um, ownership changes down the line. And I think that there's sometimes an element of um, a little bit of the, that club's identity maybe being lost 
within those ownership changes uh, and actually the fans are, are normally the mainstay and um, they normally are the people who are who are carrying on that legacy and sometimes they don't get listened to um, rightly or wrongly um, but I think there's definitely a, a, a lot to be said in terms of keeping an element of, of that identity to help that, that, that sort of um, trajectory but it's another thing that's probably not necessarily a priority it should be um, but again it's something else that that's going to take a little bit of effort a little bit of intentionality a little bit of you know I'm going to see the results or I'm going to see the benefits down the line I think Birmingham City are known as the Zulus and there's a lot of history behind that um, that I didn't know about until I got there um, and um, but actually internally is that something we still identify with no because it turned into something else you know it was it was to begin with allyship it was literally allyship and um but it got turned into hooliganism which is obviously coupled with football it then turned sour and it's something that we don't need to go into tonight but um there, there's yeah there, there are some initiatives out there which i think um the fsa are doing a, a lot on um, but yeah, mainly fan led. I think two years ago, Jane, you you were you were um, on our panel. We well, we looked at and Chris was on the panel where we did this um, this evening for International Women's Day, and we talked about how we could attract more women, you know, to, to even come into the men's game as well as obviously the women's game. Um, and I think a lot of that has gone by the by. I think a lot of that has less taken less focus and it's become much more about how we include all diversity you know in um but there is there is still a thing about women going to the game and something that blew my mind um was at leaders week um a couple of years ago where emma hayes was sitting on the stage and a, a, some of the executive team of a a club called club tawana who are a mexican uh, football team and they were the people that ran the women's football team. And they talked about how it was difficult to get people to go and see women to go and see football and how it was even more difficult for people to go and see women's football. And one of the things they did was they worked, lobbied with the authorities to have one night of the week be women's football night. And on a Monday night, it became women's football night in Mexico. And within a year, they had 50,000 people women, children and men going to watch women's football. So they just made it as, as normal as going to see the men's game. And they got sponsorship around it and they got adverts around it and everything else. And so I think there's this bigger piece that needs to actually happen to encourage people to go. And it is all around sponsorship, sponsorship of people from different you know backgrounds, sponsorship of you know women going to watch football, women going to watch women's football. I think there's this triangulation that needs to take place. What's really, I agree, because I think what's really interesting about that, Sanjay was just talking about, you know, things being from the grassroots bottom up. But I think the stuff that really works is when you've got stuff that's top down and bottom up. You have to have it from both things. So exactly what you've just said, you make Monday night or some, and I know they tried that with the WSL when it was just in the summer or whatever, but you have one night where you have, for example, is women's football night and then and then you build something towards that but and you but we know we've already got a a grass you know there's a grassroots there are women's football fans and actually what you know what's really interesting is you probably end up with a different fan base you might have some people that go to men's football as well but you might create something different that means that people that don't haven't traditionally gone to football some want to go to women's football and they know there's that one night for it or whatever you know there are things you know the beautiful thing is there'll be things that surprise us as well right um but i think it's when you've got that top down and bottom up where it works together where there are those synergies is when is when you can really make change <laughs> 